Greetings and salutations. I'm Gwen Wyckoff. I have a guest I'm going to interview this, this evening. Her name is Heidi. And the subject we're going to be talking about is the cohesion of power, and it's also called the aegis of power. The subtitle is, Until You Know Evil, You Know Nothing, Until You Know Love, You Have Nothing. And in this information that we're going to share today, we're going to talk about power, how to hold power, who held power, and how it all works. And this is because the common law trust is about the cohesion of power. It's about pulling the family together, and it's about holding the, the uh, energy of the family and directing it as a unit. Humans are not standalone creatures. We all need each other, and in a trust, we have people who have each other's back. This is how it works. This is how the uh, uh, battle was won to keep the books, the Art of Passing the Buck one and Art of Passing the Buck two. It was because I had a cohesive group behind me, and Frank was supportive, and we pulled it off. So you have these books because of power, not because of money, but because of power in cohesion. So we're going to talk with Heidi today, who is from Hawaii, had extensive experience in Hawaii with the people, the natives, and she's going to tell us how they accumulated the power in Hawaii. Greetings, Heidi. Greetings. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Now, I understand that you were born in Germany, mm -hmm, right. and you fell madly in love with a Hawaiian. Yes, I did. <laughs> and uh, so, I think you shared with me your first experience of leaving Germany was uh, your stay over in uh, San Francisco. You had a stop in... Stopover. So, ex explain first uh, your experience of that so they can get a fl flavor of your young self as you fled to your lover's arms, what was your wake-up call in San Francisco? It, it was a wake-up call in terms of coming from a small country. That's about, you can put it 40 times in the, four times or 40 times in the state of Wisconsin. So, my scope of landmass was one of smaller dimensions, and seeing San Francisco, uh, huge buildings, uh, huge everything, huge mountain ranges, just land that was so beyond my scope, it was a wake-up call. Wow, this is really, really a huge country. So, uh, and the, the, that was the first time you ever saw mountains that big? That big, yeah. And this is from the air as yes, you were coming yes, down? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, then, after your layover, you mm -hmm. get to go to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And there your husband is, mm -hmm. waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Were you married in Hawaii or before? Before. Before. Mm -hmm. And you were just so happy to see him. Mm -hmm. And he was Hawaiian. Yes, he was Native Hawaiian, is, is Native Hawaiian. And uh, so you got drenched in the culture. Yes. And you got to see the inside and the outside of Hawaii. Yes. All right. So uh, your first experience with realizing you were in a native land, mm -hmm. What happened there? Uh, it was a culture shock coming, having been born, raised in in Europe, uh, and having a totally different set of culture and experience. It was very different and very shocking, uncom uncomfortable. In Language the beginning. too. Uh, English was always easy for me. But they spoke Hawaiian. No, uh, nowadays there's only Hawaiian is only spoken on one island. In the uh -huh. and the other islands uh, resort to English for the most part. And yep. some families, of course, have yeah, a little bit more Hawaiian than English, and some have mostly English. And you had it in a family where there was Hawaiian, right? Yeah, it was. It, it is a native Hawaiian family, but most everybody resorted to English. Okay, so you were there how many years? Seventeen. And in those 17 years, what did you learn about the history of Hawaii and how the power accumulated in Hawaii? Well, in the ancient days, there was a different system starting there, uh, a system of ali'i, or noble, or royal people, who uh, 
pretty much governed everything and were uh, very much uh, into sustaining the life of the people by uh, land farming and marine farming. Mm -hmm. And then the system uh, with the influx of the first British people uh, changed to uh, an educational format for the first time to, for them to look at and then subsequently following a business format through farming land and then later on uh, importing immigrant workers from Asia, uh, Malaysia, etc. And then what happened? And then what happened is uh, after, you know, the land gradually changed in terms of power structures, uh, getting more and more into business structures and uh, corporations starting to move in, more immigrant workers came in and saw the vastness of the land and also were very aware of how kind-hearted and very giving Native Hawaiian people were in terms of giving land for services out of gratitude and love. And uh, they thought, oh well, uh, you know, this all ought to be uh, changed in format and they started to create such a thing as land taxes. And Native Hawaiians had no concept of, uh, number one, owning the land and their format it was for everyone or a tax system or being taxed. And what group did this? And uh, that was done probably by the British groups and uh, later American people, you know, white American people coming in. So which are the groups that formed the cohesion to buy the land? Okay, the immigrant workers uh, formed the cohesions when the Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino largely in the beginning, uh, migrant workers came in uh, taking care of the land and farming and farming for profit. Uh, they bought a property and then put like fam five families into a property and pooled their assets and were able to buy land. And that is how a lot of land eventually then got into Chinese hands, also by marriage arrangements of Chinese uh, marrying their daughters off to landowners. And then eventually knowing that uh, because Hawaiians didn't have much of a uh, sense of uh, payment of taxes, that they would miss out on certain things. And then the family following them, the daughters, the Chinese daughters in the Hawaiian families, would eventually possibly get into the land, get onto the land. Pay the taxes and take the yes, land. Yes, because they knew how to do that. Okay, so the immigrant workers formed their own groups by one family living in... Five families living in one building. Five families living in one building, and the Filipinos did this, the Japanese did this, and the... Yeah, Chinese. Chinese and all probably did probably other little groups. And so we had five families working for one thing, mm -hmm. and they get a pile of money, and then they go out and buy land. Yes. So what percentage of the land in Hawaii is owned by these groups? I can't say how much, uh, how high the percentage is, but it is uh, nowadays real estate as it is played. And uh, it took time, you know, to get more and more land. And uh, some of it was probably put into farming uh, ventures. So when you're dealing with uh, Hawaii and you're dealing with who owns the land, would you say the Japanese own more or the Filipinos own more? Or, or? No, I would say it's a pretty even you know, percentage or a little bit higher on one end and a little bit lower on the other end. And I can't substantiate numbers. I don't have the numbers handy. And I come from having been uh, shared with this information, not reading too much about it, but it was from a Native Hawaiian perspective. Of what happened? Yeah, and I found them extremely trustworthy. And uh, there was no other anything in in their sharing but just to convey how some families, you know, got into buying a lot of real estate and, and some land. Okay, now I understand Hawaii has a big trust system. Uh, yes, Hawaii has uh, several bigger trusts, and they were trusts by largely uh, created by Ali or by royalty. Say her name again. Yeah, that was uh, Queen Lilio Kalani had a big trust. Listen to that, folks. <laughs> Say it one more time. I'd like to hear you when you talk okay. for Hawaiian. <laughs> it, it was Hawaii's uh, last monarch, Queen Lilio Kalani. Lilio Kalani. Lilio Kalani. Oh, I'm not even going to try it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I what hope did I she say do? it right. <laughs> <laughs> what did she do? 
And she had a trust, and the beneficiaries were the Native Hawaiian uh, children and other children, but uh, Native Hawaiian children were favored, and their needs, basically. And was it educational, or what? It was educational. It was for their survival, for their uh, care, for their health care, and for their needs that they had. And then well, there was another uh, royal beautiful lady, uh, Princess Bernice Pawahi Bishop, who Pauahi? had... Pawahi? Yeah, Pawahi. Pawahi. Okay. Yeah, Bishop. And she married uh, a generous, beautiful man, Mr. Bishop, who had uh, been a philanthropist like her and a businessman. Uh -huh. And uh, they created uh, a trust uh, having very large approximately 9% of all the land in Hawaii was in their hands, in that trust. And so, in the same manner, it was to uh, run the King Kamehameha schools uh, that benefited Native Hawaiian children. And what happened with that trust? The trust is still, still active, and there's uh, a lot of uh, lawsuits, you know, held against the trust or put in against the trust. Uh, and they're uh, available, you know, online to look into. Right. right. In, in the Art of Passing the Buck, Volume 2, we have one of those uh, lawsuits where if you pick up one end of it, you can track all the others. But basically, uh, I think it was the trustees ran off with a lot of money, right? Yeah, and then uh, they, were, uh, they had resigned ultimately, and then everything was uh, changed. The whole administration was changed, and the whole setup was changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you left Hawaii, what was the condition of the those trusts? Do you have any idea? Uh, I didn't look into the trust at the time because I wasn't familiar with the trust concept. Right. But uh, the King Kamehameha schools were flawless. You know, they were run really well and uh, had very high uh, uh, numbers of students. And uh, one at that time, one of the uh, required things was that the attending students had to have a particular percentage of Native Hawaiian blood ah. in order to benefit from the school system and from education. Okay. And that's when everything in the population started, you know, really becoming uh, raised up. It was beautiful. All right. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is the good side of trust. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anything else you want to share about that? Uh, my, I'm very impressed to this day about the cohesion the immigrant worker families had uh, to pool their assets uh, and to uh, acquire land and acquire uh, ways to uh, run businesses and, you know, in the long run become quite uh, prominent people and citizens. And it, uh, from where they have come from, to build a system that, in a few generations, made them quite uh, well-to-do. Uh, the cohesion that it took must have been something else. Yeah, cooperation. And, and in yeah. the Hawaiian Islands, they're small. Uh -huh. You know, like 20 minutes in any direction, and you're on some beach, uh -huh. so you can't run anywhere. You know, <laughs> right. in the olden days, you had to have one hell of a canoe <laughs> to get out. Yeah. And so you couldn't run under the umbrella of the word aloha, is love, uh, you work it out with one another. Right. And that was shared, of course, by the Native Hawaiians <laughs> who tried to do that and, and did that for centuries, so to speak. And then everybody else uh, better adopt that or how else are we going to get along eight different nationalities and ethnicities in one room trying to have a party. You have to have some cohesion. And under that umbrella called Aloha, the cohesion was possible <laughs> right. to this day. <laughs> Well, I thank you for your wisdom and your insight, and I, I wanted to use this as a demonstration of what can happen if people mm -hmm. cooperate, if they go into a trust system together, if uh, they pool everything together. It only takes a couple generations till you're re really rolling. And uh, this is one of the problems that people have in America. As you said, Haloa, uh, Aloha is uh, 20 miles wide, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to work it out. Well, we got a much bigger country here, and I guess you don't have to work it out, but you really do. And uh, if you want to have power, if you want to have cohesion, if you want to build your life better, you're going to have to figure out how to have your own aloha, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about power, how it's built. Uh, there's two kinds of power, um, and they're all both based on selfishness. 
The first kind of power is a gain through ac accumulation and taking it from others. The second kind of power is gain through supporting the other person and expanding your connections and getting power that way. Obviously, I'm for the second part. The government here in America is for the first part. <laughs> they are the bullies. So the point of this exercise with Heidi is to show you the benefits of cooperation. Um, but we're going to, and that was the good side of the uh, quotation, until you know love, you have nothing, all right? The bad side is, until you know evil, you know nothing. Now, in reference to the situation with the Hawaiian people, I think you told me that they were uh, very uh, naive in the beginning and uh, gave up their land easily. Yes. Correct. And uh, they had no education and they didn't know how to deal with our evil British system. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? So they did not know, e know uh, uh, evil. Um, one of the situation happened to me uh, when I was little. I think I was about five years old or six and I was at school. And some con a contractor had built, had left a huge pile of uh, dirt in the playground. Well, children just love to climb up that little mountain there. And I remember the kids all running toward it at one time, and I was one of them. And one of the little boys got on the top first. And what he did is he threw everybody else down the mountain. This is called the game of King of the Mountain. And yeah, I got hurt. <laughs> and everybody tumbled on top of me. I was little, you know, I never was a very powerful uh, creature. Um, and it taught me such a lesson when I was so young about King of the Mountain. Um, the King of the Mountain game is played in our politics today, and it's all about suppressing others. Our educational system, for example, is uh, damned by uh, uh, ensuring that people can't really think. It's a compartmentalized learning. It's uh, documented in a book called Dumbing Us Down by Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. Uh, it's done deliberately. This is king of the mountain. The uh, rich who have the resources that own thir three, they have, what, how is, how's it go? It's 3% own 90% of all the wealth. I think that's how it goes. Well, this is the king of the mountain thing. Um, they ensure you cannot climb up the mountain. The important thing about the insurance that you cannot climb up the mountain is you need to have enough time to climb up the mountain. And as we saw in Hawaii, it was what, two generations? Two generations? Um, they don't even want you to have two generations. They have actually stripped out of the educational system, including the educational system with the lawyers, of how to build wealth uh, over generations. We have a client who calls us periodically from Texas, and he went to the university down there, I don't know which one, and he really wanted to learn about trust, so that was his really big passion. And he couldn't find anything about the common law trust in law school, so he went to a professor and, or some high mucky muck, I'm not exactly sure, and they said they would lose all their funding if they taught common law trust. Common law trusts are, uh, would allow the average person to build up that two generation of power to have some leverage in the world. And I think the average person is a good person. I don't think they are evil, <laughs> as the psychopaths that run the world are. And I think if we could have this cohesion, uh, and we have the format to have that co cohesion, I think that we could uh, get enough common law trust started so in a couple generations we could have the leverage to stop some of the evil. That, that's my uh, dream, you might say. I'm, sometimes I'm not based in reality, but <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be in this business. But that's what the objective of the um, Charles Arthur Trust is. Now, the... Um, some of the history of cohesion of power uh, comes from a, 
a set of books called the Book of Queens, and I think there's 13 volumes or maybe 18. I have a huge, they're all on my shelf. I've read every one of them. This was published in 1900, and it was uh, Alice um, A. Strickland. I, maybe it's Alice, maybe it was Agnes. Strickland uh, is the uh, biographer. She was allowed in the uh, Queen's uh, library. Every generation, every queen, every person who became queen was required to write their history down for the queen that would follow them. And uh, uh, Miss Strickland was allowed to go into the library and get the original documents and find out what really happened in reference to the history of England and the development of the power that rules the world because England is a very, very big player and, uh, and at one time they were the only player because most countries had to speak English. And when this is one of their powers is the history. Uh, they know the history of what the queen before them did. So when they get stuck in a situation where they don't know what to do, they can go to the Queen's Library and find out what previous queens had done. This is one of the powers of the Common Law Trust. It's called Minutes, Board of Trustee, Trustees Minutes. There's also a section in the trust book for the family history. If we don't have our history, we lose so, so much. Even though we're the little people and we're not playing royal games, we still have a lot of experience that we need to leave for the generation that comes. So this whole talk, everything I'm talking about, is how to build power, how to have cohesion, how to bring your family together, and to know what the royals did, and to know what other people have done to have cohesion. Um, there currently, we've had a, a big, uh, interesting experience with this little princess that was born. Her name is uh, Charlotte Elizabeth Diana, right? And they always give two names to the royal children because it holds the history of what went before. This is, they're very, very big on history. I'm very big on history. And I think it's an actually good idea if you want to start naming your children with two middle names. If, if the person you're naming after, uh, you know, if the, if the middle names are, you know, full of history and big, uh, moral conduct and do great things that people can do. It's a good idea. These are all the things that are lost when they stripped out uh, of our um, educational system how to pass on wealth. You know, inheritance is a huge issue. Everybody's going to die sooner or later and most everybody's going to have to inherit something sooner or later. And the art of passing on the wealth and keeping the wealth has been totally lost in our society. And I know that because of the people who read volume one, they get so astonished at how much information they don't have. One of the great uh, historic characters who uh, has a big impact on our society and the repression of people is William the Conqueror, who conquered England in 1066 AD. This guy was quite a character. They say he was probably seven feet tall. When he was born, he, the day he was born, and I guess he was born on a floor <laughs> with a straw on it, as a baby he grasped a straw. This is in the the books of the queens of England. This is why it's so fascinating. He grabbed the straw and they could not pry the straw out of his fist. So that was a signal to everybody, this boy had some power, all right? And they, and they uh, kind of put him in a kind of a special thought pattern in their mind. He was a bastard. His father's, uh, the, uh, he was born to a father's, his father's mistress. So he was known as William Le Bastard in French, okay? And uh, he uh, was favored by his father, who was a duke. And so he was given all the royal treatment, even though he was a bastard. <laughs> and uh, this becomes very important in a minute. Um, 
and he had armies and he had training and he had he had all the mentoring all the apprenticeship everything to be a royal and uh, it's a very long story it's a very complicated story and it's very funny I wish I could tell all of it but I'm gonna make it real short he, f he decided he wanted Matilda for his wife and Matilda was in the next uh, fiefdom, <laughs> next to his fiefdom or whatever, and he decided he wanted to marry her, and she decided he w she wasn't going to marry a bastard, <laughs> and she said that to his friends, and uh, it got back to him, and he was extremely angry. This is not a guy you want to get angry. <laughs> And he got on his horse. This is all in the Book of Queens. This is just hysterically funny. He gallops over to his next fiefdom. He storms into the front door, demands to see her. He, she was upstairs with her mother. And he tromps upstairs. And he grabs her by the hair. And he drags her <laughs> around the room, <laughs> saying, um, you will never call me a bastard again. You will never, never, never. And then he just dropped her, okay, and left. Well, time passed. He had a few more wars, and he got into a tiff with the, well, he got into a tiff with his father over the daughter uh, at one point, but somehow they settled it, and then, there was, then some time passed. And then there was some other conflict with the father, and, uh, and, and they had to come to some sort of terms and agreement. So the father said, oh, well, what will make you uh, end this war? And William said, I'll marry your daughter. And we already knew that he dragged her <laughs> around with hair. And so the father was just abashed. He didn't know what to do. And, but he went and, and talked to her, and he said, he wants to marry you. She said, I'll marry him immediately. <laughs> and everybody, everybody says, why? Anybody who has the nerve to come into my father's home and drag me around by the hair, I want to marry. <laughs> All right, I needed to give that background so you kind of knew what kind of characters these were. Because this was before he was even invited to the war to England. And so she was quite the queen. She was one of his kind. She murdered as many people as he did. They're all murderers, these things. These are not things. These are all dressed up in human body creatures, OK? Um, so he, um, what happened in England to cause William the Conqueror to become king is that, I think it was King John who ascended to the throne. And there were two things that happened at that time. King John raised the taxes, which is you never should do, because the people were, will rebel. But the big thing was that he was not of the blood. He did not have the royal blood. He did not have the royal blood. And therefore, and that was the biggest reason, that uh, William the Conqueror had to amass <coughs> all these armies and go conquer England. And he had automatically, because of the blood, and this is called cohesion, if you're not getting it, <laughs> connect the dots, he had the support of the House of Orange, which is what, uh, Netherlands? Netherlands? Netherlands, yeah. <coughs> and uh, he had the support of France because they were of the blood. And he had, I think, the support of Germany because they were of the blood. So the royals would not uh, allow anybody on the throne uh, without the blood, which is the cohesion. Uh, so they all came together and they conquered England. Now. This is where suppression comes in. Uh, Matilda had been in love with an English person prior to William, all right? And William thought of him as a fop. <laughs> you know, he thought he was feminine. I think they, the men in uh, England at that time were wearing uh, makeup, eye makeup. <laughs> they had high heels, you know. And, uh, William the Conqueror just thought this was just absolutely disgusting. He thought all English people were absolutely disgusting. He hated all of them. It was just ugly business. So he, as he ascends to the throne. <coughs> and uh, this is really important for legal reasons. Uh, and he changes the entire legal system. And he hates the English people, so he says only the French 
uh, you have to be represented by a French person, or you cannot <coughs> um, make a lawsuit, or you can't do anything by contract. It all has to be in French, has to be in the French language, and he would not learn English. Okay, and uh, so he set it up to make it very impossible for the English people to uh, have any to participate in the government. And uh, that lasted a hundred years before it got changed. But that's what they do in our court system now. They say you have to have a lawyer. It's the same thing. Okay? And he also set it up so that you would have a court system where you'd have battles, you'd battle each other instead of try to resolve it. That comes from William the Conqueror. So, <clears throat> That's him, and he's a big, big part of the history, and that's what cohesion will do. Now, we have, uh, we have Henry VIII, who, and we're talking about pow power. Henry VIII was extremely powerful. He's the one who broke away from the Catholic Church. You've got to really be powerful to do that, to really think you're the cat's meow. But... Uh, what he did, and this is what is happening today in our government, he set up his council to be evenly, evenly balanced between Catholics and Protestants. And he made sure they were always evenly balanced because then they were uh, of no, they, ha they had no power. And if you will count how many congressmen and how many, uh, you know, how many Democrats and Republicans there are, you will always see that they are evenly balanced, even if one is a couple more than the other one. That's how they make sure that Congress can do nothing. Got that? Everybody's clear about that. Now today, we have more Republicans, but you notice they're not getting anything done either, right? Can't do it, okay? Uh, I got all this stuff in here about beheading. Uh, because it's an important thing to understand in the political arena what, uh, what Henry VIII and his daughter Queen Elizabeth did. Henry VIII beheaded his opposition so that nobody could stop him. So we don't know how many he beheaded, but we know how many because I have the Book of Queens. We know how many Queen Elizabeth beheaded. You want to take a guess? Couple of hundred. Couple of hundred. You're short by a hundred. Three hundred. <laughs> she beheaded three hundred to keep her power. And I also believe she beheaded them for other reasons, which will come up in, in uh, another com in another uh, lecture, which will be called uh, Rome, Women, and Trust. So we'll get into that later. Uh, Queen Elizabeth was known, she had so many connections and there was so much fear of her that she is known to have been the single most devastating power to stop evolution on the planet. And when she died, the Renaissance began. So we're talking about King of the Mountain, right? Pushing people down, pushing people down. Okay. Uh, okay, the uh, leadership in America. Let's move over to America now. Uh, in the 1800s, and I'm reading a book called Morgan, and this is about J.P. Morgan, American financier. Um, by Jean Strauss, S-T-R-O-U-S-E. It's a very big book. It's 700 pages. I don't think I'll ever get through it, but it's the mo one of the most fascinating histories of America and how America's power uh, happened. And America's power happened between, and this is going to surprise everybody because it really was a surprise to me because they never admit to this one. The two greatest powerful people to make America happen are Andrew, Car Andrew Carnegie, that's his first name, right? And John D. Rockefeller. 
John D. Rockefeller, of course, we know oil. But the uh, Andrew Carnegie, I didn't realize he was such a steel. He was into steel. And he was an inventor, and he would buy inventions, and he would do everything he could to make steel better. Those two were the most powerful inno innovators in the 1800s. And in the 1800s, of course, America, what people don't understand about America is we've never had a leader. The president has never been able to be a leader. The Congress has been hung up, you know, like I just described. And so where does the real leadership come from? Well, I knew from back in the perceptions days where we researched some of this stuff, I knew that the Congress was taking orders from the financiers who had an organization in New York. And I even used to know the name of the organization. And that organization bought and paid for the uh, congressmen and the senators and the president. And this organization was the heads of major corporations. But here we find it in this book, page 157. It was Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller who decided that Congress was useless and that we have to control everything from New York. So that's how it works, by the way, in America. Now, the reason those two guys got to do it it's what I call is the principle of the wolf. In a wolf pack, if you don't have an alpha male, you don't have a wolf pack. All the wolves become lone wolves. There's no cohesion. But you get a wolf that's an alpha male, he'll control the uh, pack, and uh, the pack will have cohesion, and they'll f uh, hunt with cohesion, so they'll have plenty to, f to eat. So these two guys were wolves. They had cohesion. They had power. They were mag magnets. Okay, they had the dark power because they were hurting the farmers and they were hurting everybody else. They kind of didn't care. They were taking everybody else out of business. They were total king of the mountain kind of guys, but they supported each other because they needed each other. One was in steel. One was in oil. How does the oil going to get transported without the steel? And how are the trains going to move without the steel? Trains were the next one down who could control the trains. But in, uh, in the 1800s, it was uh, up for grabs. It was really a fight uh, over who would run, who would own a, a uh, railroad or who wouldn't. Okay. Uh, let me see. J.P. Morgan, this book here. This is very important in reference to discovering how mentoring occurs among the rich and the famous because once you know how they do it, it's easy to copy it. J.P. Morgan's father was named J-U-L-I-U-S. Junius. 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 I always have a hard time with that. Junius. Now, no one ever hears about Junius Morgan. But he was obsessed from the time he was a young man to become an international banker. And in the 1800s, he uh, was vying for position with the Rothschilds. And he was over in England. And he was using J.P. Morgan as a um, leverage. He, he was using his son to position himself in America. It was pretty political. And J.P. Morgan. Uh, wanted to be a banker. He wanted to do all that, but his mother was very frail, and so he was not a very robust kind of, he didn't have a robust constitution. He was kind of sickly. So uh, he, ha he would have to take a, a whole year off and rest between periods in his life. But his father was a driving force. He would not let his son uh, stop uh, being J.P. Morgan, <laughs> as we know J.P. Morgan. And J.P. Morgan was, uh, it was pretty brilliant at what he did, all right? He, he did the financing of a lot of the railroads and financing of the government and all. He was in the thick of the hottest, hotbed of evolution of America in the 1800s. Uh, but his father began uh, apprenticeshipping and mentoring him when he was very young. Every year he would be sent to a different uh, sc a prep school in a different country 
so that he would learn the language and he would make the connections with the other rich boys. So that when he grew up, he had the connections that were necessary in the world to uh, establish the J.P. Morgan fortune. His father had this, this vision. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I have mentioned elsewhere that when J.P. Morgan was 13, he was already mature enough to be an ambassador to France. That was pretty awesome. Okay. There's, uh, like I mentioned before, there's the, uh, the selfish way of holding power, and then there's the kind way of holding power. One is to support the other, which expands and brings more wealth. The other one is to control through the dark side, which is bribery and murder. And there have been several articles on the internet that uh, have studied the rulers and the leaders of our world today and have absolutely condemned them as psychopaths. The problem with the dark and the light battle, if you want to say there is one, is the dark will always kill you. The light isn't so quick to do so. And, you know, and freedom in the world of politics always de-evolves into evil. It always, evil will always dominate in a free society. I used to be amazed that, um, I think it was Hong Kong, when they, they gave freedom, they gave a whole bunch of freedom to their people. The first thing they did is they put in a special police department because they knew freedom would de-evolve into evil. I, and I just was amazed. Uh, so the whole issue with holding power is apprenticeship, mentoring of the children, raising the children correctly, and um, uh, making sure that they have connections, and uh, making sure there's a leader. You need a wolf. <laughs> Everybody needs a wolf. <laughs> Whether it's a good wolf or a bad wolf, I'm using the uh, I'm using the uh, example as a wolf just as a leader with no good or bad associated with it. Just the person who can pull the common law trust together, the person who can make the cohesion, you've got to have that. And uh, you also have to learn skills in how to have conversations with each other if you want cohesion. There's a whole lot that can be said about that particular point the skill of talking to each other, but there's books written about it, there's other people teaching it, so go find it. All right, I, have, I am done. Is, uh, we have some people here who might have some questions. Do you have any questions? So I have a wolf. Um, there's a, and I can't remember the author who, you know, who came up with this, but I thought it was kind of an interesting look. Uh, he said that there's, there's sheep, there's wolves, and then there's sheepdogs. Oh, yeah. To protect the wolf, protect the sheep from the wolf. Right, right. Okay, the sheepdog has the power of the wolf, can meet him, you know. He can stop the wolf, yeah. Course, but the sheepdog doesn't prey on the sheep the way the wolf does. Yeah, right. Now, once again, it's a metaphor, but... Yeah, it's you know, the same thing, yeah. I, I think, yeah. It, you know, there are people in the world who want to exercise power for the right reason. Yeah, there are. And then there are people who want to exercise power to... Over. Right, yeah. right. So find the sheepdog. Well, you see, the sheepdog couldn't take on a pack of wolves. Well, you need a pack of sheep. Well, yeah. this, is, this has been the, the theory up to now is that you need a, you know, a, 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 you know, a bunch of sheepdogs to take on the pack of wolves, but it's all, it, it, there's always this conflict. Uh -huh. And I think ultimately, um, you know, the long-term solution is to create a society where you're not constantly breeding more wolves. Well, that comes with yeah. uh, the mentoring and, of the children and the education of the children. Right, and that's exactly the right. So, you know, if, if we, in, in, in my view, one of the challenges we have today is to convince people uh, that raising of children should be done peacefully and not violently. So they don't learn the language of violence. They don't learn that violence is the way of the world. They don't learn that they can get their only they can only get the resources and needs they met by taking them from somebody else by force. 
Well, the problem with that is the parents are already damaged by their parents, by their parents, by That's their parents. That's the challenge we have. Yep. How do we change the courses? Yeah. Well, you know, I've, primal therapy teaches you how to... Yeah. Well, there are people who have, you know, yeah. ideas and, and practices that, that will you know, achieve this. It's just there's a good deal of time it takes right. and a good deal of education that needs to be done. So one of the reasons I'm... I like doing these videos. Yeah. Get educational. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this one, this one needs to get out there. <laughs> you know. All right. Well done.